welcome back to the Creating Synergy podcast. Today we have the wonderful Claire Scapanello, CEO of one of the largest aged care providers here in South Australia, ECH. Welcome to the show. Well, well thank you for having me. <laughs> Uh, really, really excited about this one. I, you and I have caught up a couple of times and had some remarkable chats and uh, yeah, really excited to share your story uh, to everyone on the show. Um, normally I like to kick off learning a little bit about who is Claire. So what do we need to know about your earliest context to understand that the, the person that's sitting in front of me today? It's funny, I was thinking about childhood and growing up and influences and preempting this question around what were those elements that probably have led to to where I am today and also uh, my outlook on life, how I approach what I do. I think um, early, so I grew up in Adelaide, um, spent uh, 22 years here, then moved over to Sydney. Um, so I have returned, great. Um, which is great. And um, I think for me, um, one of the things that my mum always said to me when I was young is you always asked why. Your constant question was, but why, mummy? But why? <laughs> that would have and driven it, her insane. It, <laughs> it drove her insane. Um, but now I think about, you know, the five whys and, um, yeah. you know, what sits at why, um, yeah. the question as, as a leader. I think there was something in that from a really early age is into my curiosity as to why were things the way they were. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, I had a, a, a great role model from my mum both from a, I think, a female independence. Um, you know, my mum my mum worked, which mm -hmm. for me that was unusual uh, in comparison to a lot of my friends growing up, that yep. she went to work every day, she juggled home life, family, an enormous amount of sport activity, which mm. I still cannot <laughs> fathom how either of my parents drove us around to all of that. So how many siblings were there? So myself and my sister. Yep. And, and, uh, what, and two what, years apart. Two so, years apart, yep, yeah. Yep. And, and is your mum Italian also? She's not. She's she, not okay. So father Italian, yeah. my mum is Scottish, um, both fiery, passionate yeah. mix, but very different. <laughs> so Because it, the Italian, because I'm of, of Italian, the Italian tradition is that, well, especially when we grew up, was the, the mum was at home, right? Correct. And so, and, yeah. Correct. And it was really interesting, I think, also, that, was, that wasn't necessarily my dad's expectation yeah. either. Um, and I think that would be an influence from his his mum and I dare say they grew up in, you know, really challenging World War Two times, mm -hmm. northern Italy, um, you know, probably different influences around um, the roles in a family context as well. And I think my grandfather got sick quite young, so my grandmother really stepped into mm -hmm. um, the provider and, and that's been interesting on both sides of the family. So even for my mum who worked... So she ran her own business, didn't she? Well, my, no, my grandmother actually did. Okay. So it's it's multi generational. Yeah. My grandmother was actually the business owner, and she had uh, a shop, and that was during the sort of sixties, seventies. Um, what type of shop? She 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 actually had a fish shop, a okay, fish and poultry right. shop, in a very wealthy part of Scotland yep. in a beautiful village, which I was lucky enough last year to go back with my mum, and we, you know, went and explored her. Um, sort of her life growing up yeah, in the great. village, which was fabulous. So, um, you know, I had two really strong role models in in the sense that independent from a female perspective, both financially but also from a career perspective, that that could still be part of that mix. And I yeah. think from an early age, you know, it subtly gives you the influence that you can do really whatever you want. Mm. Um and that going to work and having a career and enjoying it is a fulfilling part of life. And I, I think that probably started early on. So just going back to your why questions, mm. right? I mean, curiosity is what every child is born with. And for some reason, us as parents can, you know, we can squash that a little bit by saying, be quiet, shut up, sit down, don't touch that, you know, all these different mm. things. Um, curiosity was obviously harnessed in you. Is that what you're yeah, saying as well? Yeah, and I think um, we're always involved in adult conversations. Mm. So um, I think what was different, most of our family friends, um, they didn't have kids the same age. My parents were both older as well. So mm -hmm. my mum was 35 when I was born. My mm -hmm. dad was 44, mm -hmm. which was really old, mm. um, you know, 45 plus years ago. Yeah. Um, and that was also unusual. So they had 
been together 12 years before they got married. They'd travelled the world. They'd had their own life and independence also before having children. Mm. So I think there was that level of worldliness as well. So the why questions and being able to answer and explore those was something that certainly uh, my mum encouraged, albeit yeah. I think it was probably quite annoying, <laughs> um, but certainly encouraged. And I was a really busy child, so I would never sit still. Um, I was hyperactive, which um, <laughs> also probably was quite challenging for mm. my mum. And I was into everything. I wanted to learn as much as I could about anything and everything. And I think, you know, I think there's a level of curiosity and then you take it to the extreme. Mm. And um, for me, it was always, you know, practical learning. I wanted to be hands on. I wanted to um, experience as much as possible. And I think that for me was that real starting point of this love of learning, this thirst for learning and, and constantly absorbing lots of information mm. Um I was always a very good sleeper as well, which as we now know today is important. Is extremely important and something you know, I'm horrible at. Yeah. It, it, it's I, I would like to say it's a skill. I mm. think you're you're naturally born to be a good sleeper yeah. for some people. Um, but as I've grown and now sitting um, at this age and as an adult, the importance of sleep around doing roles like this and actually how it really sticks information and it becomes um, you know, that deep sleep that yeah. really is nourishing for yeah. both the cognitive capacity yeah. yeah it is restorative and I think that's something that's been you know important and I've valued actually that ability to sleep really well oh it's a it's a real topic for me at the moment I've recently bought a whoop yep. band which tracks everything and the data I actually thought you know I how hard is it to sleep, right? You lie down and but as you know as a CEO there's a thousand things going on through your head. And I I'm, I'm absolutely trying. Like last night, I thought, right, I'll go to bed, 9, 9.30, um, wake up at 6.30, so it's a good nine hours. I thought, be beautiful. I was awake for two and a half hours last night. I, my brain just pinged on at three o'clock. I could not go back to sleep. It was just... I, I just don't know how do I keep how, – what's your trick? Is there anything that you uh, – we'll get, we'll get We'll get to, get to that. that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I woke up this morning at 4 a.m. because the dog wanted to go out to okay. the bathroom, which was quite <laughs> annoying. And – I also was having a terrible dream about um, I hate heights. Yeah. And in my dream I was on the top of a building and I, I didn't want to go near the windows. <laughs> <laughs> and I, th th this is a weird one where I have no idea why I'm afraid of heights. Oh, I am too. I don't like them. I don't like them. I've worked in a 65-storey building right up the top and it never bothered me because there was mm. no windows, there was mm. no way out. Yeah. But anywhere where, where I'm up high and there's a window, I just it, – it, it is – this terrible fear of falling yeah, or, 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 or being inquisitive around, oh, what's down there? Yeah. So um, yeah. getting back to those sort of those early, earlier years and I think some of the formative things that happened that has driven me where I am today, um, being busy child, I love sport. Mm. Um, I played everything and anything. Yeah, okay. um, I swam, I played touch football, netball, tennis, uh, I athletics. So, you know, all of this energy that I had was probably channeled into sport for a really long time. And I think there was the inquisitive nature. I found school, um, for most of it, actually quite boring. Mm. Uh, I would get, I remember my mum told me I got told off because I'd asked too many questions in class. <laughs> you know, we encourage children to be curious, but then on the other hand, we stifle the curiosity in the traditional learning Correct. sense. Yeah. Um, which luckily is moving towards a more practical, more open, inclusive learning style. But I think, you know, you go back 35 years, it, it really wasn't. It mm. was um, a very structured yeah. approach to learning and that just didn't work Yeah, don't ask me. questions outside what's in this textbook, please. Correct. Right, yeah. And I wanted to know everything yeah. that wasn't in the textbook. Yeah, and you would challenge it and I was the same. I would challenge yeah. it and, you know, we were fortunate enough um, as kids to travel around the world with my parents. We spent months away you know, through Asia, all through Europe, learning history and art yeah. and culture. And that also was sort of frowned upon because it, it wasn't the norm around mm. children going and exploring like that and coming back with this worldliness yeah. at such a young age. So that was that was interesting and I think for me gave me perspective of we're one little place in a very large um, 
interesting and historical world yeah. and here's the love Adelaide, yeah. right? Not to mention the pale blue dot in amongst <laughs> the galaxy, right? Exactly. So, exactly. The, uh, yeah. Let's not even go there yeah. of the why are we here question because mm. that's another big Correct, one. yeah. But I think, you know, through those schooling years, I went to an all-girls school. I think the opportunity there to um, just bring out what it was that you wanted to do and there was nothing holding you back. I think there was this real sense of empowerment um, that I personally um, found through that process. That You know, there's no distraction from boys. Yeah. Um, and to be honest, I wasn't that distracted. I loved playing sports, sport probably, and um, I had lots of family friends who were, were males as well. So yeah. it was just normal having guys yeah. around, you're all mates, that was it. Yeah. Um, I did a lot at school as well, you know, magazine club, um, so I wrote the school magazine. You were involved with everything. I was involved with everything, debating, you, magazine you, club. Do you think that all your co-curricular activities, um, you know, debating and all the sport um, has really set you up? Like, I'm a firm believer that, and, and particularly team sport, will hold anyone in good stead for the remainder of their life. And this is why I've really sort of, um, you know, pushed my girls into basketball. They love it, right? They play quite high divisions. But the the point that I I grew up playing a lot of team sport and, and the learnings that you have from mixing with different people from all walks of life, right, different socioeconomic levels, um, different – uh, neighborhoods with uh, different perspectives, different upbringings and trying to blend them all together in order to win the premiership or something like that and build strategy and train and set goals. Like all these things have, I believe, set me up for life. I, I will 100%. Mm. Um, I think, you know, I was reflecting on there are individuals who play to win. Mm -hmm. That's their only focus. Yep. There are people who play because they love the team collaborative um, achievement that you get from a being in a team. I think, I, you know, if I look at the team sports versus the individual, you know, the individual being swimming and running, yep. there is something meditative about both and there's something around how far can I individually push myself to achieve that personal goal? Mm. Can I do a second faster? You know, it, I think for me part of it was, yes, it's great that you got first but also around being able to continue to push yourself. Yeah. And um, that is a different sense of personal achievement. I think the team sport for me gave me a sense of winning and losing. Mm. And I think that I loved the game. Mm. I loved to play. I loved to be a part of it. Um, naturally, you know, I am partly competitive. You, you you don't really do this role unless there is a, yeah. a slight competitive streak. Yeah, it's going to be some sort of animal inside there. Yeah, and I think <laughs> it's also the drive to just keep going and going and mm. going and going. Um, so I think that certainly influenced a lot of, um, you know, my personal drive yeah. and also the, the being really collaborative. I think the other part with it was during that, because I love sport so much, I also led – our sports teams, I was house captain mm. for sport, I was swimming captain of our school. That also from a really young age, and that was both junior school and senior school, you start to develop leadership capabilities mm. around you're responsible for another 200 girls in a big team who have to come together, share a vision, get the spirit. You know, we had the spirit cup as well yep. for, you know, how good did we cheer? Yeah. But... You have to then figure out who's going in which race. You need to put them in races. You need to organise all of these people into every athletics yeah, yeah. activity. And all of a sudden you're having to start actually managing large groups of people. Mm. You're having to think about how you're going to manage the time and actually look at what's going to give you the best result. Yep. And it's something as simple as that. Then you start thinking about, okay, well, but doing that and learning that when you're 16 and younger – I think starts that process around thinking about larger cohorts of people. How are you going to get people to have a shared vision, to follow you, mm. to inspire them more importantly? And, you know, that's so much today of being a CEO are all of those attributes. And I think through that it gave me, um, you know, a sense of what it meant and how to go about it. Yep. Not that you necessarily always got it right, mm. but... Um, I think the practice of that from such an early age certainly helped. I think also younger years for me, 
So I was a chronic asthmatic. So I spent a lot of time in hospital as a child. And, you know, it would be up to maybe four weeks a year um, at the women's and children's. So I think I'd been in every ward in the women's and children's (laughs) except ICU. Uh, Yeah, wow. So I'd seen some things that, you know, are really confronting as a younger child um, when you're in those environments with, you know, people who have had 80% of their bodies burnt. Mm. You have had people who have had uh, craniofacial um, (laughs) surgery, which, you know, I think also gave me this different sense of how lucky I was and also that being quite accepting of, of all different types of people in all different situations. And I think you know, there is an enormous amount of resilience also that is built as a child because you have to keep getting through, mm. you know, being sick and quite sick. Yeah. Um, and I think that also started to build those levels of resilience um, at a younger age and also being quite self, um, sort of self-reflective because you had a lot of time by yourself. Mm. You know, my mum went to work. She came to the hospital in the morning. She went to work. Then she came back. You know, she juggled all of that at the same yeah. time as well. There wasn't iPads and mobile phones. There was no there. iPads. Yeah. There was no mobile phone. Yeah. So you went and played or um, you were in your, your room and yeah. your bed mm. the entire day. So you do also therefore have a lot of self-reflection time mm. um, in those moments as well. And, and certainly How old were you at that time? Uh, from two years old until probably about 16, 17. Yeah, wow. So um, I think I only spent one week in the RA here um, in Adelaide and one week at actually RPA in, in Sydney. Um, and then, God bless, medication changes and people mm. inventing great new medicines yeah. and medicine changed and touch wood, I haven't actually... Been um, back in no, and, and never had a chronic attack like that again. Well done. So um, it, it sounds like, you know, your parents obviously had a massive influence on your life and recently your father has passed away. Yeah. Three yeah. three to four weeks ago. Four weeks ago. How are you going? You know, I'm okay. I have my moments but I think um, for anyone who has a loved one who has dementia um, and is going through that process, For some people, it's a a fairly quick process. For us, it was a really long process, um, almost nine years from when he was diagnosed to passing away. And so I think for the last two years, the person that we we really knew had was gone. Mm. And that that's also as difficult to watch. Mm. Um, He had a great life, though. Like he was almost 90 when he passed away. Um, His brother died. The next day, which was yeah. also this poetic sense of best friends, brothers who died a day apart. Brothers died one day. Was was your uncle? He un- was he unwell was, as well. Or? Yep. Yeah. Um, so and and that was a more rapid um, decline for him. Uh, he was ninety four. Um, so they both had great lives. Yeah. And, and I think my uncle retired at forty nine. So yeah, wow. he, so he had this. Forty years. I know. 40 odd, it's, sorry, forty, 40 odd years. Odd, I mean, I was like. If only today. So um, they had a great relationship and I think, you know, there's a sense of poetry in that they both went together. Mm. Um, You know, whatever we believe in happens in the afterlife. Um, There is a sense I do get that there was something cosmic about it. Mm. They're up there playing cards somewhere. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Well, my uncle loved playing cards. He was a regular at the Italian club. Uh, My dad was a musician, so completely he would have been entertaining them all. So, um, but look, you know, grief is something um, that is challenging. It's something we experience also from a work perspective um, all the time, Mm. um, given what we do. I think what was lovely about, you know, you're saying goodbye and there's a, a finality to it. I think the other part was we made it a celebration mm. and I think that's something we need to do more of. Yeah, um, absolutely. Because people lead wonderful lives and they leave, you know, things behind that we should celebrate, not commiserate mm. a lot of the time. And um, we had a whole sing-along in Dad's funeral, with Frank Sinatra, him singing it my way because um, he always used to sing my way, but used to sing in the middle for a joke. We did it sideways. <laughs> so, yeah. So, well um, well so we had to, we had to finish, um, 
you know, his life and story on that, which was actually um, really fun. So That's so good. Yeah. Well, condolences to you and the family. But Thank you. Um, no, it sounds like he was a remarkable human and he was. Lived, lived a great life. Um, so I'm going to skip a few years now. Okay. To 2009. Yes. Where you suffered from an injury yep. that changed your life forever. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah. Um, so I, you know, I moved to Sydney uh, sort of to, to keep advancing career and I think, you know, when I when I left, I was like, I always wanted to be, it was, always wanted to be a CEO. I don't know why, mm. but always wanted to be running and leading my either my own company or another company. Um, and then... Was that ever since sort of you went to uni then or...? Yeah, it, I would say it was from, you know, 21, 22, yeah. you know, had this aim of... When you got into the corporate yeah, sort of space. Yeah, yeah, there was, a, there was a part of me that always was looking for that. And, and you know, at 29, just turning 30... Um, took on my first exec role for a, for a, a global company here in Australia, um, which, going which through. Which was that? So um, it was Safilo, which is the yeah, that's right, yeah. sunglass and um, yeah. optical manufacturers, yeah. and they were starting a retail operation in Australia um, and was part of that team. And, you know, doing a lot of travel, uh, busy, and then was out surfing uh, on the northern beaches with a, a friend of mine. Um, let's just say I was being very lazy. I was teaching her to surf and I wasn't a fantastic surfer. So by any stretch of the imagination, I was no sort of Lane Beachley, <laughs> yeah. nowhere even remotely close. <laughs> um, and I was being a bit lazy and lying on my surfboard for um, and, and with my back arched for about an hour, an hour and a half. And then I went to get up because I thought, okay, now we should actually do some surfing. Got up and, and went to stand up and felt this kind of twinge in my back. And I thought, oh, that's a bit weird. You know, maybe I've, you know, pinched a nerve or just pulled a muscle, got back down. Um, and that is just the, the, this, I can only describe it as nerve pain, just didn't go away. Stretching on the beach, I said to the, the friend who I was with, look, it's right if we go, like, there's something not quite right, I feel sore. And anyway, we get in the car, like it was, it was sort of getting worse and I'm, like, we, I'm getting like, I, 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 I get cringed. Like I can feel like, you know, when your bum tenses. <laughs> I, I, I really, I know oh, the, you don't want I, this pain, trust me. I know, I know the story. Like I'm, I, I don't like this sort of stuff, but so keep going. <laughs> I, um, we, got, we got probably five k's down the road to Newport to put petrol in the car and I literally thought I was like an 80-year-old woman crunched oh, over. No. Just all of a sudden this pain and it was um, – and, and my walking started to get a bit harder like it was really stiff and I thought, this is a bit odd. And I said, can you drive? And then as we kept driving, I'm like, there's something really not right. And we rang a friend of mine and she said, right, the closest place, medical centres, Chatswood, go there, see if you can get seen and, and figure out what's going on. So – by the time we got there, which was about a 40-minute drive, um, I got out of the car and, and, and was really struggling to walk and um, made it up into the uh, Chatswood Medical Centre and they're like, oh, you know, why are you here? And I said, oh, something wrong. You were surfing and having trouble walking. And the next minute they're like, right, you're not even sitting down. You're going straight into the triage bay. And was seen by a doctor and they're – you know, there's something nervous system related, sciatica or something else. Um, but if you're having this much difficulty walking right now, you need to go to Royal North Shore Hospital um, and get checked out. So we get back in the car just they're like, do you want us to call an ambulance? So it was at the point of do we call an ambulance here at Chatswood Megan's I'm like, no, it'll be fine. Jesus, yeah. Get, get back into the car, kind of hobbling just staying upright. And then between Chatswood Medical Centre and Royal North Shore Hospital is only about three k's away and in that time we got to the hospital and they they pulled a wheelchair over and I actually then couldn't move my legs to get out of the car and that was when I think there was a sense of oh something really not right here. this is not good this is not good but I think the interesting part is because you always you, you connect a lot of the time by having some sort of injury or there was um, and you played an a lot accident. of sport, Yeah, right? the, so an accident you, that all of a sudden, well, this is kind of weird because I haven't mm, really done anything. Mm. So um, they drive the car around and I'm in the ambulance bay of Royal North Shore Hospital being pat-slided out of my own car. Jeez. 
And I was like, wow, okay, this is quite, this is getting a bit full on. I'm dragged into trauma one, which is the, the, the first bay when you come into the hospital where it's the full emergency and there's just people everywhere trying to figure out what's going on. And then they're like, right, okay, um, you, you don't appear to have broken your neck or any of those things, which is kind of the first things they're checking. And I could just move my legs a, a little bit up still. Um, and then I went through to, a, to a, so the first acute bay and they gave me a whole lot of endone thinking, again, well, you haven't actually injured, so there's been no trauma, so um, let's get you in for a, a, an MRI and see the neuro team come down or the neurosurgical team to come down and have a look. So I think around seven hours or so later, someone came down, they're like, there's something not right here. Like the movement in my legs had still um, started to go, so I really couldn't move my legs by then. And then they're like, right, you're booked in for MRI first thing in the morning when it opens. Um, and so I was like, okay, you know, this isn't great. And I didn't want to ring my mum and oh. alarm her <laughs> at that point in time because I thought, <laughs> you know, there's been so many other things uh, that, I've, that I've done and ringing her from a hospital that I'm like, you know what, I'm just going to wait to see but, what happens but how, tomorrow But how were you? In, like, were you panicking? Were you... Uh, look, I don't think I was panicking because, uh, you know, growing up having had different things that have happened between glandular fever, salmonella, food poisoning, all ended up in hospital, yeah. all ended up in a... And I thought, you know what, let's just yeah, hold but out. But not moving your legs is a big thing. Yeah, that's thing. a big one. <laughs> it's a big one. But you see, there's things that, you know, severe nerve, trap, in tra like trapping nerves, things like that can actually cause... Um, issues to that extent, um, probably not as far as, as where I was. No. Um, but you don't know. No. So, and also the pain for me was in sort of my lower abdomen. So when I went for my MRI, that's what they were looking for. That's where they were looking. Um, but the next morning when I, I woke up and, you know, you've, you've kind of got lots of endone, you know, everything going on and they're, they're trying to sort of figure out what's going on. Um, I rang my mum at about 6.30 in the morning and, and, and said, look, mum, I'm in hospital. Mm. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh. I laugh because I think it's <laughs> probably I'll either cry or laugh. Mate. And had to, had to say to her, look, mum, I'm in hospital. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> but I can't move my legs. Oh, no. I'm just and, thinking her about her on the phone. Oh, and, the I, and, and the other thing, <laughs> I think, oh, God. Um, and I'm like... I think you need to come up here. And I said, I don't know how long for. So she's in Adelaide, yeah. She's in Adelaide. Yeah. So um, once I'd rung her, I said, Mum, can you ring the office? Can you ring my boss and tell him what's going on? Because I don't know when I'll be taken away. And, um, you know, that was for the MRI first thing in the morning. And I said, look, get on a plane. So she packs a little bag thinking oh. she might be here for a week. Yeah. Uh, she was here for three months. Yeah, wow. Uh, almost four. Um, and... Yeah, basically she was on the next flight and up to, to Sydney. And they couldn't find anything wrong when they did the first MRI. Still legs don't move. They're like, okay, what's going on? Um, so they're like, okay, let's actually have a look more broadly. You know, there'd been MS in our family. So was this, you know, potentially doesn't, doesn't, MS? It doesn't come on like that though. It does doesn't it? come on. Well, there, there's a whole, I mean, you don't know. Yeah. So they, they wanted to check for that. So then they did... Um, MRI of my upper spine, thoracic, sort of cervical and uh, CT as well. And um, they found what was what they call a atraumatic spinal infarction from T7 to T11 through your thora middle of your thoracic. So basically uh, an infarction is, is a blockage or a stroke so when you, you have a, yeah. a, a an infarction is used as something that's actually um stopped blood flow to an area um and mine was an atraumatic spinal infarction which um is very rare um normally you'd see something that was a traumatic that there's been a blockage or there's been an accident or there's been a severing or partial severing of the spinal cord mine was just outright came out of nowhere so when you say rare I think you told me you were, there was only sort of 10 cases of uh, this. There's, there's a handful in Australia yeah. like mine. Wow. Um, and there'd been 
a number in the US, Japan that had been reported. Um, I later found that out, um, sort of doing my own investigative journalism. Yeah. Um, but the prognosis, I remember, came sort of three days later and um, I was in, it was probably about seven o'clock at night in the hospital room. Mum there and a few of my girlfriends and the, the neurosurgeon came in and terrible bedside manner, just terrible bedside manner. They need to teach more bedside manner when they're, they're actually yeah. teaching doctors around mm-hmm. and very complex of, or life-changing um, yeah. uh, sort of communication. Yeah. So um, you're dealing with a dickhead doctor as well. Yeah, anyway, and, so. and, and, and unfortunately <laughs> he probably because they didn't know your life as the person didn't probably shift the conversation to be more empathetic. Or, mm. So basically the discussion came in and said, look, we've done more tests, this is what we found um, and we're not sure that you'll ever walk again. So that's the... Jesus. What we know right now in the prognosis, you and haven't had any movement. So my legs, by that stage, I had no movement at all from the waist down and I'd lost sensation um, from the waist down on the outer layers of my legs, so what the dermal layers, so um, hot, cold and, and if you, if I still get pinched to the back of my leg now, I can't feel it. You can pinch me as hard as you like, I won't feel it. <laughs> So <laughs> I've got no yeah. So what's going on through your head when those words come out of his mouth? Like, what's the? Do you, do you remember? There was were there was and initially a lot of tears. There was a, there was the moment of oh my god, what is happening here? Um, and I think it was the reaction. Hang on a minute. Wait wait a minute. I didn't have an accident. Like, how come this can't go back? How, you know? how can how can this be the case mm. with this kind of injury? And I've had no accident. Like nothing happened. Mm. In my head, nothing had happened. Um, and that was something that for a long time you sort of keep processing over and over. The first kind of couple of days you're just coming to grips with, oh, hang on a minute, this just this can't be happening, this is bizarre. You're still having lots of tests to figure out what's going on. And I think for me there was this moment of, hang on a minute, you don't know how it happened so you're not sure what's going to happen next. Yeah. And I think once I got that into my head was probably a saving grace around um, how you keep yourself um, in a place of moving forward. Um, you know, lots of people in these situations and I saw a lot in the spinal unit, you know, severe depression, yeah. there's grief, there's yeah. a whole range of emotions of what you've lost because of what's happened. And for me it was like, right, you can't tell me why it happened, so you can't tell me what's going to happen next. So, I'm, yep, I'm, I'm going to walk again. In my head that was, um, for me, sort of where I wanted to at least to get some movement back. Do you think it could have gone the other way if you fell into a state of depression? Oh, easy. It, yeah. So easily. So, so this element of stoicism that you've brought into it is – held you in good stead right like it, I, this is something that maybe might be within my control yes therefore i'm going to do my utmost to make sure i can walk again yeah and it is because you know you talk about when you talk about what you can control can't you can't control Correct. you know the locus of control when yeah. you sit in those circles um i think a part of that is i can control how i look the outlook i have on this where i let the emotions or I go down this path or this path. I think for me it was, okay, what are we going to do next? Mm-hmm. And as I've grown as a person, I've learned more why I had that particular view of the world was, okay, we're here right now. What do we have to do to get here? If I'm never going to walk again, what can I do? And I think the moving forward part um, is something I'm constantly moving forward mm. and I'm constantly looking, um, you know, down the road of what's coming next. And I remember you the said co- you, as you've gotten older, you've learned why you think that way. What, what have you learned about yourself in that I, space? I think um, it's interesting. You do so many different tests around who you are as a person from a leadership and, and more recently been looking at, you know, your Gallup strengths and and the futuristic part where you mm. spend very little time dwelling on the present. You're looking 
ahead. Always looking forward. And I think in, in roles like this, when you're in any leadership role where you're determining strategy for you, there's always forward motion mm. and there's always looking ahead at what's coming towards you and how you're going to have to deal with that. And you pl- start playing the scenarios out around, well, what if this happens? What if this happens? And I think that helped me work through, okay, well, if I'm going to have to come home, I'm going to give it, and I said this to mum, I want to give this three months and let's see where we are before the decision to have to relocate back to Adelaide because the options were limited. It's come back to Adelaide, you end up in Julia Farr, come back to Adelaide and you might be maybe Hampstead Rehab, for example, and, you know, or going home which in that case you're then thinking through, oh, my gosh, the home modifications you need to do. We live in a two-storey – my parents lived in a two-storey mm. house. So thinking about all of these things. Um, the, the biggest part I think um, for me was, you know, I, I needed to take control of where I was, how I was – what I was doing, how I was approaching or how I was seeing myself in the situation. And th- there was moments of tears. There was, there was grief primarily I think when no one was around – um, because I was really lucky and I have to say the support network I had for people, like I would have the <laughs> friends had visitor schedules. Hmm. So every day I would have series of different people coming in to see me. My room looked like a florist shop. You could smell it when you came to the start of the ward. It was that strong. And for some nurses, I mean, this is there's a particular nurse who actually couldn't work in the ward anymore. <laughs> the smell was so <laughs> strong. <laughs> But, you know, I had a, an amazing team of supporters from a f- from friends' perspective, but even the team at the hospital at Royal North Shore, you know, the average stay in a spinal unit is about three months. Mm-hmm. Um, you are with a group of people who are all going through traumatic life-changing um, events that is their own doing or, or not, mm. like my case. Um and you have a lot of time for self-reflection and I think good and bad in that situation because, you know, you can go down a path where I'm just going to retreat, this has happened to me, you know, um, feeling sorry for myself in that situation but I think I've always been, you know, what do I need to do next? Okay, let's, let's try and see what can we get working? Is there anything? Because... The one thing that they gave me was a slight chance of, okay, we don't know what's going to happen. Mm. And I remember the neurologist um, who came and saw me and he said, your body is like a computer. There are many ways to open a file. You don't just have to go file open. You know, there's different, you know, there's file explorer. There's these different pathways that you can use. Correct. Your body is no different. Mm. So yeah. what you need to think about is how do you get those pathways happening in other ways. And that was really good advice, I think, for me to to kind of think about, well, our body is an amazing complex structure. So is our brain. You know, there must be things that I can do. She's got to find a bypass for this thing. Kind of. And I remember the day, the first day my, my, I got my toe moved. Mm. And it was about four weeks into ho- being in hospital when I'd had so many different drugs to try and, you know, release the swelling or maybe um, change, uh, you know, you go through heparin, steroids, all these things. And I remember it flickered and I saw it flicker. I was sitting there and then I remember the next day I said to the doctor, my toe moved, like I got it to move. And they're like, can you can you do it for us? And I couldn't do it. Mm. And I was devastated. I went, no, this couldn't have been. It wasn't just a spasm. I, I, it actually, I actually moved. Did, yeah. And then they came back the next day and I could move my toe. And what, 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 did, what did that feel I was like? like, oh, I can move it. Home. So, you know, like as you, you talked earlier about your future focus, but which is, you know, possibly one of the greatest strengths of a CEO, but also one of the biggest kryptonites, right? Because you're not focusing on the present and, and both as a human being and at work. Being so present in that moment when your toe moved, what did that I, feel like? I was like, this can't be happening. This is... And I remember I'm like, okay, now, now you just got to get to move again and again mm. and again and again and again. And all I did was keep looking at was my Was it feet. just the same foot every time? Couldn't get so there. It started on my right toe, my right big toe. 
And I, all the the only thing I then was focused on is get that right, try to move again. Because I, pr- I wanted to prove the doctors wrong. Yeah. And I proved them wrong. And then I managed to move a little bit more of the next toes and then the other toe on the other foot. And then little by little. And it was literally like getting your feet to move. So each day there was a tiny little bit more movement. Um, and then by about four weeks I could lift – I could lift the bottom of my legs up from my knees just um, and that was like, okay, this is awesome. Game on. Game, exactly. <laughs> um, and being competitive, it's like right now, what yeah. next? Yeah. Um, and bit by bit. But, you know, you get more movement back but it takes an enormous amount of energy. Yeah. So what most people don't realise, you know, when you're recovering and it's an, this neurological injury – I remember the first time I got to stand up and walk and I had splints sort of on my legs to make sure that I didn't break my – literally I didn't catch my foot and break my leg or anything like that. I walked five metres and I had to sleep for two hours. Yeah, wow. The amount – Because you're retraining your body, aren't you? Yeah, and the amount of energy Mm. it took was enormous. Mm. Um, But, you know, being – back to your point about being present, you are in that moment. You are nowhere else but that moment because you don't have anywhere else to go. Mm. Um, And I think when you are present and you have those levels of self-reflection around how am I I dealing with this, how am I doing, Um, you know, you get to learn a lot about you as a person. You also learn an enormous amount about your body, you know, how we made up, um, you pay – so much closer attention to what's going on and that that's interesting as well um, just from a how do you feel what's your body doing um, and at this point you know you can't you know you're not being able to go to the toilet on yourself mm. you, you know there's a whole range of other things that are going not just the walking but you know having an injury like that you can't get up and just go to the bathroom no and no. I, I just, I'm marvelling over the, how you remained calm. Like, were you calm the way, whole way through? Because I, I, I put myself in your shoes and although I think I have a really positive and growth mindset, I'm one to get emotional, right? Like, and I get like, – there's panic sets in. It's like I don't, I, I don't have control over this, although I potentially do – there's an element of fighting. Do I have control? Do I not? Do I don't even know what's going on. Like there's that's where the panic can come in, and I think that's actually something that comes into a lot of leaders as well in mm. in the workforce. Which is there's things that are happening that are without that aren't in my control. Therefore, I start to panic. How, do you think? Yeah, I'm just interested in your mindset around mm. that. And do you think it's held you in good stead? Yeah, it's true now too. Your, Absolutely, and yeah. I think because. When I was younger, those years spent as a child in hospital, the idea of being in hospital for me was something fine. I Mm. I was fine with the experience. Some people, the experience itself is really traumatic, Mm. just being in that environment. Excuse me. Um, But for me, I was used to it. So um, that's something that I think I was able to deal with as the first part. So get rid of that and, and put it in a box. I think there were parts where I compartmentalised different things that were happening when, okay, this is what I need to be focused on. I'm just going to be focused on this, okay. When people aren't around, then let me let the emotion out at that point because it's me by myself. Then around being very pragmatic about what was going on. And I remember sitting down having these conversations with mum going, mum, if I, she's like, you're going to walk, you're going to walk. And I'm like, if I don't. We need to be having a conversation about what this means next. Will I come home? Will I stay here? What will that look like? And I think, you know, there is a sense of I couldn't solve it all and I could only be in control of what was sitting. And I think that became something that I got quite focused on, what I could could control because the other stuff around was just going to happen irrespective mm. and there was nothing – that I could do to change the situation. And I think it took me a lot to understand that this wasn't something I necessarily did. It's just something that happened. Um, And I think I remember my girlfriend who um, 
who I was teaching to surf that day, I think she took a huge emotional load that it was her fault that this happened to, you know, one of her best friends and it wasn't her fault and it just happened. Mm. Um, And that was something I think you really keep going over in your head. It was there's no reason for it. It just happened and some things just happen in life and, you know, you can't control everything. Uh, and I think, but you can control exactly to your point how you respond to it. Mm. And I think that has had a huge impact now when I'm looking at how I view the world um, in my role. But even as I was moving through other roles up to this point, was you do let go of okay all this little emotional energy that people get carried away and, yeah. and hang on to. What for? Mm. Really, what for? And I think that was the big shift for me personally. Um, I think I was lucky. I was in hospital three months. Then I went to rehab. Um, and th- this part of the story probably connects a lot more to what I do today and why mm. I do it. And um, I think part of my personal purpose. So then I went to rehab and, and weirdly, because you're young, you've had a stroke technically um, in your spinal cord and you can't walk but you're not really still in the spinal unit view because you're not paralysed completely. So um, still an incomplete paraplegic Um, and, you know, there are many people like myself and and sometimes it's not seen, sometimes it is um, with walking issues or walking aids. Um, You have a lot of residual challenges that come with it. So, you know, you do anything that traumatic to your body there are other implications around, you know, physiological. So, um, you know, your stomach, bowel, bladder, all those things get thrown on their head as, ra- as well, mm. <coughs> which is awesome. <laughs> um, but uh, they are small prices to pay for being able to walk. I went to a rehab that was for people who had had strokes yep. and also knee and hip replacements. Now, when you're going to a rehab like that, the average age is not 30. The average age is about 65, Mm. 70. So um, fundamentally the unit I was put in was really an aged care unit for um, recovering from those types of um, either surgery and or um, incidents. Yeah. (laughs) And that was eye-opening. And, you know, they had to keep... How you said you said... I was 30, 30 at the time. Um, and I'm sitting there doing hydrotherapy rehab with a whole bunch of um, 70-year-old men, which I think they just they, they loved the concept of having a, a younger woman there and th- they were quite funny. But, um, you know, you're in this environment which is very institu- institutionalised. Mm. You don't really have any other activity except for every day you're doing physio or the OT is with you. It is so regimented, 7.30 breakfast, 12 lunch, 5.30 mm. dinner every day. It becomes robotic. It does become robotic. Um, and that was, again, I think was more challenging mentally than the ho- being in hospital for three months. Yeah, you would think that that regiment would be, well, that structure would be make it easier on you because you would know what to expect, right? Like you don't have to think about anything else because you, you rehab's your highest priority, so this plan. But you're saying that in actual fact it was worse. Yeah, it, it is worse. There's there's no individual anymore. You're just a whole group you're doing right. the same thing every day. And the monotony of those types of activities. So I would do four hours of physio a day um, and that in itself was tiring and then you literally you get up, eat, Exercise, eat, exercise, eat, sleep every day. So, so, so you lose what it's like being a human in that space. A little bit. The other thing I think during that experience was one, um, you know, there were eight people in a big room who were all older and I was just like, this is awful. Mm. Like, A, there wasn't any fun engagement. Everyone was either in their beds um, and that gave me real insight into 
sort of age care and the experience that people go through, in particular when you're talking about rehabilitation but also in residential age care mm. as well because that was fundamentally what the environment was like. And that gave me a really different perspective on ageing. Um, also on, I think, um, living with a disability or, or being, you know, I had a disabled parking permit when I when I left hospital. I gave that up because I'm like, there's actually worse people than me who need those car spaces. Yeah. So I always get very annoyed mm. when I see people using them that probably oh, shouldn't be. Um, infuriates me. Yeah. Um, I... I left rehab uh, after four weeks and was lucky enough to go home. Um, and, and walked out? I walked out. Brilliant. With a walking stick, but yeah. I walked out. Um, and so where are, you, where are you at today then? So I'm, um, you know, 15 years later, I don't use any, haven't used any walking aids since not long after I left rehab. I um, do a whole range of things. I ski, I ride bikes. So full mobility? No, not no, at all. No. no. Um, and this is the bit which is always interesting because I, whilst I can walk and I can do those activities, I can't run, I can't jump. Um, I catch my feet a lot if I'm tired and I'll fall. Um, mm. I, and that's the, the challenges of having a neurological um, injury that is also unseen that it impacts though that that yeah. mobility um so for me it, it's it's hidden a lot of the time from the outside world because it's not obvious mm. it's there but it's not obvious um but i remember four months out of rehab i thought you know what what's the worst that's going to happen to me, I've already been told I can't walk again. I've got these injuries. I'm going to go skiing. Oh, jeez. So got on. Firstly, got, <laughs> got back on my snowboard and went. Oh, this is a lot harder balance wise. Yeah. So went. Okay, let's pick up the skis and uh, start skiing again. And so I did, and strangely could do it. Okay. Not necessarily well to start with, but now I can pretty much ski anything. Um, and As in proper snow skiing, or yeah, not, snow, not water, so, so not water, no, not water skiing. Yeah. Pretty much um, uh, snow skiing and weather. The only thing I can do is the plow, and I still fall I over. I don't like the plow. The plow <laughs> actually doesn't work for no, me. No, it's no good. Oh yeah, because yeah. The so angles. Um, I still like the side side stopping. Um, is probably my preference. Yeah, because but, you've got practiced in doing that. Right? Yep. Yeah. Um, and uh, that's so down the black runs, everything. Black runs, yeah. Um, here, oh, Europe, everywhere. Well done. Um, and that's been something to keep challenging myself mm. again. The how I think this is the competitive part of, of my nature and the, the sporting part that what could I do mm. and found things that I could do. Yeah, brilliant. The grief on that though, the, the thing that I grieved the most was the inability to do those things. Mm. So I can't run across the road um, like a normal person. Mm. So I have to think about... Where's the car? How far away it is? Yes. Like I'm really conscious a about... a whole bunch of calculations that need to be do. done. You yeah. do. And even the calculations, okay, where's the closest bathroom? Hmm. Um, because, you know, part of the injury is that it impacts um, your bladder and hypersensitivity. Yeah. Well, you said that as we you came in today, right? Yeah. I, I'm, I, I, yeah. It, I'm always... Yeah. It's, it's a really funny one to yeah. get over the modesty of mm. it um, and just go, okay, this is just part of it. And, um, you know, you're always looking for these things because, you know, they impact how you see yourself personally mm. and your confidence as well. So they've been some interesting learnings through the whole journey. Well done. And that's an amazing Thank story. Thank you for Thank sharing uh, with us that, that insight. I, I think um, your ability to, to think about what could be and stay calm and present in the moment is something that shows tremendous leadership and um, strength. So uh, great, great work on that one. Um, I do want to jump now into your career, which has been full of growth and transformation and resilience with, you know, 20 years of senior leadership roles and um, he but really heavily focused in areas like marketing and brand um, communications and, you know, your last role you said at RSL was uh, the digital chief digital officer, um, which is a slightly different path to CEO, right? Like you typically see the CFO, the COO or whatever it might be um, 
moving into a, a CE role. And in 2022, you stepped into the role of the CE at ECH, which, you know, your first CEO gig, big, significant role, one of the biggest um, aged care providers in South Australia. How's it been jumping into the fire pit? <laughs> Do you know, um, it's been great, actually. Um, coming back to South Australia and Adelaide after a long time away, you know, is an adjustment in itself. Um, I actually moved back here before I, I got the role and I was commuting to Sydney during COVID, which was which was interesting, and working in aged care during COVID. So I think the role that I was in before um, in a really a big, much bigger organisation than ECH um, was complex and challenging and that entire time I think was preparing me for this role. Mm-hmm. And I was part of the sort of the CEO succession. Um, this was a conversation that I was having at the yep. time with my CEO. And what did I need to do? And one of the big things for me was around I needed to be able to drive and have revenue lines, different operational elements um, within my remit. And, and that was part of the focus in that last role so that I could move operationally across different areas to prepare me fundamentally yep. for now this role. I think what's always interesting, and it's and you mentioned the start around my background and the path, it is the path that isn't frequently chosen mm. as a CEO. I think it's interesting. I was um, I worked for Pacific Brands, um, Bonds Burley for yep. quite a while, and Sue Moore. For both in that time, I had two. There were two female um, heads of group general managers for both the businesses. Sue Morfitt went on to be CEO of Pacific Brands. And her background was school teacher, marketing, and then into CEO of, of an enormous organisation. Mm. I think at the time they employed about 10,000 people. Yeah. So it was possible. I'd seen it possible. Mm. Um, but it wasn't that... It, it wasn't that frequent... It was the road less travelled. Yeah. I was looking for the word then. Yeah. It was a, definitely a road less travelled. And I think for me, you know, I have always been so focused on the customer. For, as a marketer and if you are a true marketer, you are immersed in the strategy of the business. You are looking to the future, what is happening next, how are you informing the business about this through insights, through research, through looking at trends. That's such a big part of a marketer's role and then if you have the commercial nous that goes with it you can start seeing really clearly how the two drive an organization and and for me that was very much the path I took I think the other thing um, that has helped my journey is my mum worked for a computer company so she worked for Olivetti for 15 years Mm -hmm. so I grew up around computers around technology around digital Um, and that was a key part of this transformation for me into this role was digital has always been at the heart of everything I, I've done as well. Um, and, you know, when we look at today's landscape, that transition into a digital landscape, understanding it, how um, platforms, what do you need to do, how do you connect all of this together is essential um, and, you know, is one of the areas today if you kind of read Harvard Business Review or even I think company directors did an article around today, what are the attributes or the skills that CEOs of today and tomorrow need? You need to understand digital. Mm -hmm. You need to understand customer and customer strategy and how that influences culture, um, how it influences how the external landscape see you as an organisation and also then how does it drive your business decision making? And I think for me, those were the elements that, you know, the board were looking for at ECH um, and the importance of customer today, in particular, not just this sector, but many sectors. And I think if you look at, um, I think it's Woodside Petroleum, the CEO came up through a similar stream. Mm. Um, You look at some of our larger organisations in Australia today, both listed, unlisted, the females who are also moving into those roles primarily have a very different profile and background. Yep. Um, you know, in any organisation... Which is which is great, right? This is a- amazing. I think the, we had the, a CEO of um, Mitsubishi, uh, Sean Westcott, and he's got a similar... He started in HR and went into marketing and then went into... And now he's by far one of the most 
amazing CEOs that I've seen. Um, so I think, yeah, I think it's, I yeah. think it's, it, it should be more of it, to be honest. Well, when you look at today, the importance of customer and the importance of employee. So to that point, yeah. coming through a people and culture lens, it's so important to get those parts right. And I think for me then having, you know, breadth of operational exposure during all of my roles. Because in marketing you need to know every part of the organisation, yeah, how it fits together, how it works. You drive sales. But not only not only how the organisation works but how the external world works as well, right? And, and what do the customers want? Yeah. Because you help influence the products that are actually put to market, um, the services that are delivered What's the pricing of them? How yeah. will they work in comparison to everything else? So it does give you a really good breadth of experience and insight into the, how an organisation works. Um, I think, you know, we're seeing less of the traditional operations or finance roles moving in and, and now a blend of skills um, and experience to, to make it you a relevant CEO today um, and I think part of it is also when you think about where do you spend the most money from an internal, you know, if you look at the money most organisations spend on digital today, it's huge. Mm. They're transforming their organisation either for the customer or they're moving from existing legacy platforms and systems into new technology. And for some organisations, that's a really big expense. Mm. And if you have no understanding of it, yeah. you're not asking the right questions either. Well, it's not a, not only a big expense, but it's a big change for oh, the huge change. for the people who are going through it, right? Huge change. And so, in your roles in the executive world, going through those changes, how have you seen the importance of change management, in, in like especially with the complex stuff? How how much emphasis do you place on change management? Um, I place a lot on change management, and it can be delivered in different ways. I've seen it um, delivered more subtly bottom up and it's it's a slow burn mm -hmm. around what's happening with a long lead time until you're getting to the change. Um, and I think that's the priming, the taking people on the journey. Yeah. Um, I have, you know, last couple of roles, big transformational change in an organisation where you've gone from paper manila folders to using Workday for 4,000 staff. Yeah. You know, that's a... That's Huge. Yeah. And in a space of a year. Yeah. So, you know, you need change management professionals to come in and help with that process because it's so important to understand what the different groups need and actually how to communicate that in the best ways. And, and the, you know, I think for me, knowing when to use those different change roles in an organisation... If I was to say now my view of importance of change, um, I think almost every people and culture team today should have a change role in there. Without it's doubt. constantly looking at the evolution and that's something we're looking at internally around transitioning some of our change capabilities and training capabilities that have been working on projects but into now ongoing, yeah. just ongoing activity. Because it's not only about digital, right? When people no. think of change management, they think of digital. This is about digital's restructures. Digital is the enabler. It, it, well, it's not well, the... Digital is a enabler. Yeah. Right? It's, there's so many other forms of change. There's organisational change. There's restructures. There's mergers. There's so, there's so many different types of changes which impact the human uh, within and, the business. And to your point, the human. And I think it's, you know, I always have to manage the human versus the, the business and that's one that probably I... Ch I is, is one of my greater challenges around getting things done because I am someone who likes to achieve. I'm always moving forward. I'd like to see it. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm action orientated. Mm. So it's right, everyone, come on, let's yeah. get moving. Yeah. I have to remember that not everyone changes at my pace and I, I change quickly. Yeah. And I'm already, I already have the answer, you know, and six steps ahead and that's something I have to continually check because not everyone is there with me. And so... Yeah, that's a big I, part of change. I uh, I fall into the same category. I work for a company. I lead a company that manages change, and I am um, that that same uh, persona as you in mm. that space. It's something you always need to check yourself with. Um, and I, I guess look, there was one thing that you said. There's a there's a slow burn to change, right? Which is how do we? And, it, and what, the way I hear that is there is a real emphasis needed up front 
in making sure that we are dotting the I's and crossing the T's and we are setting this project or this program or whatever it might be up for success. There's a whole bunch of work that needs to be done because too often we go from this, right, we're going to design and we, this is what we're going to do. This is the change that we're going to make. This fits in with our strategy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're all going forward and then we jump in, right, let's execute. And there's this, there's this gap, which is what we call the enable phase. There's this gap where, you know, we haven't done the research. We haven't figured out what is actually in scope and out of scope. Mm. What, what actually, how does this actually, uh, what, what's the context behind this? How does this connect to our strategy, the client, the customer, the community, you name it, down to how does this interact with everyone around? You know, if I pull a lever here, what happens down, down there? followed by the perspectives of everyone. So if you follow that sort of framework up front, you can really set your project up for success. Mm. And that's where I think change management falls down and there's this rush and push and speed that we keep skipping that part every single time. Yeah. And I think the other bit that where I've seen any change fail and, and to your point, change can be so many different areas in an organisation. Um, anytime you're taking one person from doing one thing to doing something else, there's an element of change involved. I think what's really interesting when you actually are leading an organisation is the rate that people can absorb change, but also how are you hiring people for change? We mm. talk about adaptive capacity and how do we actually employ people into the future that, that has have, some, have those skills yeah. and have the agility and... You know, today that's becoming so much more important because of the fact everything is moving so quickly. Correct. I mean, it, it, it was like yesterday I was watching, um, there was uh, actually, it wasn't, it was this morning, and one of the original board members from Chat GPT, and she's an Australian, born in Melbourne, she's in her 30s, mm. amazing. It just well blows my mind actually. <coughs> and she was talking about the rate of change as well in this environment around AI and how it's being used and we've gone from now... AI with chat GPT to you can actually create a video telling what it does. I want a car doing this on here and it yeah. will create the video for you. That propensity and the speed of change that is happening from a technology perspective impacts all of us. And that's no different in the workplace. And sometimes I think we separate the two around people's ability to change and people can change mm. um, and that's something that you know as a leader you're constantly grappling with the balance of how much change is enough and also do why do we call it change and, and this is an interesting one because if, if you would know as I do having led so many of these big projects and the words transformation and change can be used as dirty words correct right and and so I try and avoid using them these days and not because I, I, I 100% believe in both and they are so important, but it's people's perception when you say it and that it, it's, you know, we're doing transformation, transformation. Mm. It's actually, no, we're just modernising what we did before. Yeah. Is we're on a constant evolution. Yeah. It's continuous improvement, continuous improvement. And using that language around, you know, we're just doing something different each day and doing it incrementally. I mean, transformation fundamentally is incremental change that leads to an outcome of you've transformed from one to the other. Agreed. So that's something that I think is, is critically important. It's funny that you say that transformation, because we have the exact same view, although we call ourselves a change management company, right, Because and transformation company, mm. because that's just what the norm is, right? And to explain it any other way will, will be, hard. you know, from a marketing point of view, it's too difficult. Yeah. <laughs> People, they wouldn't know what you're talking <laughs> yeah, about. exactly. So, but... But what – because everyone says the same thing, right? Mm. Change is, uh, and transformation is essentially a dirty word. It's like the word pivot, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, everyone's <laughs> new favourite word. Yeah, correct. Let's, let's not use that word. But what's interesting about that for me is that change has been done so poorly – that it becomes a dirty word, right? Like, yep. it, that, isn't that just a clear shining a light on the fact that we do not know how to manage it properly? I think, and this is again my experience, my personal perspective. I think why it gets used in that way is because it's an easy finger to point. Yeah, to. and and you know when you go through really complex projects, there is so much finger pointing when things aren't going right. Correct. than ownership. Yeah. And therefore, 
let's blame the change. Mm. Wait a minute, you're responsible for making people come on this journey. Mm. Well, if you build the wrong product because you didn't listen to the people to start with or listen to what needed to happen, it doesn't matter how good your change is, it may be amazing you're going to have problems. Correct. Not to mention if leadership aren't on board with it. So that was my second. Yeah. That is my second point. You have to, if you are doing organisational change that is going to set you up for success into the future, if the leader, the CEO of the organisation is not committed, understands and is championing change, forget it. Yeah. I have seen... Game over. I have been in organisations and big listed businesses where we have been driving consumer strategy change and the implementation of it through the middle of the organisation down and trying to influence above and the executive having no concept of what you're actually trying to do and or did not see the importance of listening to the customer or customer strategy or transformation Mm. and you sit back and you go okay but this is happening in your business Mm. why aren't you paying attention to it and why aren't you leading it and owning it so I think for me, the, the where I've seen the greatest successes is by far that there is, right even from the board and the CEO, that commitment to what you're trying to achieve, the, the uni- unity at an executive team of why you're doing it and that we're all part of leading change. Yeah. Um, and I, it's about evolving an organisation for the future. It's not, it's not about just sitting still. So... I think that's the part for me where I've seen it fail. And then what happens is you get executives finger pointing around mm. why it didn't work. I will blame, you know, the, the transformation team yeah. for change or because they're easy to blame because they're complex and they're subjective. Here, here, you know, package that one up, um, Gabs, and put that one out there <laughs> on our marketing to, uh, run. So I think, um, I, you know, what I'm about to ask you might be a little bit controversial and might piss a few people off, but... Why are there still CEOs? I can't fathom this. Why are there still CEOs or leaders out in the world in this at, at the moment who just haven't got this in their head? Like, they, they, how do they? How do you reach a position where you're leading an organisation where the world is constantly changing and updating and moving from one way of doing things to another, like consistently? Like, change is the new norm, right? But yet they still put their head in the ground like an ostrich, right? Like why? Why is that? Look, I think um, I think it's exposure to environments which uh, engender change or engender these type of activities. I think you know more traditional industries have very set ways of doing things for very particular reasons. So the importance or the experience that is gained around seeing how different organisations operate or different industries, I think hampers that. I don't think it's intentional for many. I think it is just purely a outcome of the experience or the exposure you've had to different industries and organisations and different approaches to um, sort of, if I was to say, innovation or, and I don't want to use the word change in that respect, but... Um, you know, different approaches in how organisations would run. And I think probably one of the, I mean, I certainly um, was very inspired in the sense of what they were trying to do at the organisation was Michael Cameron, who was the CEO when I was at GPT. And, you know, I remember in, I think the the 2014 strategy was about taking the organisation through transformation and this transformational change of the organisation. And it was so clearly mapped out. And, you know, you look at that vision back then when most big property um, institutions were not even thinking about the customer and we were part of a whole customer strategy arm of the business. Yeah. You know, that was forward thinking in what it was a traditional industry. And, you know, there are pockets of it, but I, I guess it's having the experience and also the desire to learn what's going on in other organisations that are so different to yourself that may actually be um, beneficial I think scale is a challenge as well yeah. where, you know, for some organisations the scale is just too big to do some of these activities. So it's like, well, let's just stick with the hardcore financials yeah. that we know that drive it. Um, I think in leading into the future, the power employees have and the employee expectations will have to shift that. And boards themselves, because remember, boards appoint CEOs. Correct. 
um, a CEO is not just appointed, you know, by the other executive or other no. people. It's appointed by a board. So it also begs the question around how are boards educating themselves in these areas yeah, as well. Yeah, their capability as well. Yeah, and, and I, I have to say, I'm, you know, I'm really fortunate that, I, that my board have a really diverse mix of skills and that have, they have very different influence on, on the outcomes. And, you know, I think, again, you've got to ask, always ask the question yeah. around who, who's, who are you employing for and what lens do the board take on the type of person they want leading their yeah, organisation yeah. and, and the, the custodian of that organisation. Yeah, I, 100%. There was a, a leadership study done recently uh, where they interviewed over a thousand odd board members and said um, who had just recently fired a CEO and th- and 31 percent so the number one leading cause for why CEOs were fired 31 percent was because of mismanagement of change that was it so so the it seems though boards are starting to move it, in it the is, right direction yeah which is great but yeah I think I've gone to the days where we can put our hand in, head in the sand and not know about the change that's going on in the organization and I think it's interesting and and I've been having different conversations with people if you to go back 20 years and go and look at what were the skills or the remit of a CEO in comparison to where it is today it's changed dramatically mm. Um, you had the very traditional, I have my corner office, I have my secretary out the front. You know, you, you, you didn't see the CEO. You didn't have engagement with the CEO. Um, they were, you know, almost in their ivory tower and mm. untouchable and they led from above. Mm. And there was this... Jack Welch type. Godlike, <laughs> yes, godlike. Um, and I remember even when I started, yeah. um, you know, that, that view... I think what we saw with changing workplace culture, we've seen that role transition into something different today. And that's not all organisations, but I think the expectation from employees and boards is that your CEO is more visible, they're engaged with the business, they understand what's going on with their employees, they're they're 100% invested in the feedback that's happening from the ground up that they need to be across a lot more information and a, and a lot more of what's happening in the business, not just working on the business, but, and there's the balance of, the bo- of both, but that, you know, they're part of the organisation. I think, you know, when I was coming into this role, looking at where do you take inspiration, and, and I listen to lots of different podcasts and Blinkists and, you know, sort of, thinking about what am I bringing to the role, how am I showing up and, you know, having spent years in retail on the floor that you were, you were actually out on the floor working with the team mm-hmm. as an executive. Um, the executive, the CEO of Best Buys when he started in the role, spent all this time on the floor getting to know the business. Mm. Um, and so that was one of the first things I did when I took on the role today. I went and worked in our Dementia Day program you know, I got in my uniform like every other staff member and I experienced what it was like for our clients to actually visit a Dementia Day program. Yeah. What did they do? You know, I had some amazing experiences around our music therapy. You know, we were all singing along um, to, you know, In the Jungle, The Lion Sleeps <laughs> Tonight, which I don't think I've done since I was at school. <laughs> but you're looking around a group of people and seeing the joy, the engagement, mm. That's what we do as an organisation and I think for me it was actually really being amongst yeah. the work we do and understanding it. And um, I think, you know, they're the expectations today that CEOs, you know, yeah. need to immerse themselves in the organisations they're leading and understanding from the ground up what's going on. I like that using the retail methodology. I think um, we had Martin Hayesi on the show who... Um, you know, built youth works yeah, and, many years and, ago. And, yeah, I was. Yeah, you know, I, I bet you. We've all shot there. Yeah, we've all shot there. And so Martin's um, strength was that he, you know, as CEO, put himself as an employee under the store manager at a different store every single weekend, just so he could be part of it and be connected. And he, and then you know, Fridays he would give himself a thinking space into be able to what he could then do to. Um, improve and and continue the quality. So th- there's a lot to be said for being in amongst it. And um, uh, but I am conscious of your time right now, and I do just want to ask a few quick questions. Obviously, mm. around the aged care industry, before we jump into sort of our um, uh, quick fire questions mm. at the end. 
it, it, the aged care is one of the you know biggest growing industries in Australia by far, and it, and and one of the biggest growth sectors, I should say. And um, what what do you think, in your eyes, is the biggest opportunity? Because you you said that to your point earlier around it, it felt robotic and. Um, uh, what what is that industry looking at doing to be more inclusive, be more, you know, bring more life back to it? Because it is an industry that is going to touch every single one of us at some point in our lives. So, yeah, just mm-hmm. interesting your thoughts on that. Yeah, it's. I mean, there's lots of talk at the moment as well around the sector. So, you know, this week, um, Mark Butler, the Honourable Mark Butler, was here um, talking to a lot of providers around um, how, for example, retirement living can play a part in that ageing journey and care, so shared care. Mm -hmm. Um, If I look at the industry, um, you know, one in 20 workers will work in this sector in the next 10 years. Um, The growth in just the people needing care. I think we go from somewhere around about 2.1 to 3.4 million in Australia. It is huge growth. The baby boomer generation moving through is going to mean that care is going to have to look different than how it is today because we are going to have challenges with workforce and it's a compounding issue. We don't have enough houses for people to to come and move to, you know, somewhere like Adelaide. Um, then you've got international um, workers who um, people, you know, migrating to Australia um, for a better life who have skills that, you know, whether it's nursing care, uh, that is also a, a key part of being able to provide housing um, for them. For them as well, yeah. When we look at um, residential aged care in its traditional format of which ECH don't have any more, um, they were very forward thinking in their approach to selling that in 2000 and. Um, 14 and focused on keeping people at home and home care and retirement living. So um, I think if I'm looking to the future, I see digital technology playing a huge role in care Um, more from, and when you talked about you've got you on your arm, we're also looking at, well, what what do those devices look like for people, older adults? Mm. Especially if you start thinking about there's going to be um, more people living with dementia, Mm. um, cognitive decline. You've also got um, people who don't have family. You know, we have a lot of people who, for example, my parents until I moved back were here by themselves, one child in London, one child in Sydney. Um, They're not going to have the people around them to necessarily care for them. So how do you start building support networks around people who don't have them? Mm. And this is where that reconnection with community is essential. Also, I think that people do want to stay in their own homes. Yeah. That familiarity, their community, their location, um, that is something that I think is becoming more important. And residential aged care, there is the absolute place for it. And having had a, my father spend the last four years um, in residential aged care, the challenge is that they they need to evolve to be more home-like. Mm. Um, but there is a huge amount of money that's needed to be invested to do that and that's also a challenge. Yeah. You, you s- use the word digital being playing a huge part. Do you think it's – do you think there's risk and, you, and then you said about nursing and workforce sh- shortages. Do you think there's risk that digital will become so overwhelming that it takes away the human element of what aged care – should provide. I mean, because that I, I think it's an enabler of some of the activities that are that are delivered today that could be delivered through a digital in, in, interface. Mm. So I'll use the example. So we send today normally if there's medication that needs to be dispensed, for example, you need to send a lot of times someone out to ensure they're taking the medication and therefore you're marking yep medication's done. Blah blah blah. You know, we will see there's – it's already in the market – automatic pill dispensers Mm. that then you can engage and say, yeah, yeah, I've taken my medication. Um, If you need to have a quick checkup of how you're going today, let's look at your blood pressure or your glucose if you've got diabetes, which is the most common um, disease for older adults. Yeah. You can do that through a virtual teleconference. Yeah. So there are different ways to um, have the right oversight and I think there's a difference between – using digital um, as a sole engagement tool 
or using it as sitting in the background, doing monitoring, um, some level of actually engagement with where you're doing a specific task orientated, yeah. but also around um, understanding the person, how they're moving around their apartment, what are they doing, are they going to the bathroom more frequently, therefore there could be a trigger for a, a UTI, yeah. has their temperature gone up, how are they sleeping, are they getting up and moving around in the middle of the night, or are they leaving their home at one o'clock yeah. and wandering. You know, that's how I see digital coming into to this sector. I, I, I agree. I think it's a massive benefit. I think if you move to a world where there, but go back to a world where there wasn't digital, there was a nurse going to the room every hour or whatever it might be, right? And if, um, you know, Joe Bloggs is, uh, you know, 85-year-old male in his own room, He's wearing a whoop band potentially and all these health metrics are saying, yep, he's good, then no one's going there the whole day potentially. And is that... That's not good. That's not good. So if I was to say where you want to spend that energy, it's not spending it on the me, the, the, the tasks that could be done through digital automation to free actually people up to actually have the engagement side, mm. um, social interaction. So we know that isolation is going to be a big issue it already is Correct. it's only going to be exacerbated with the with this sort of volume of people moving into the and workforce setting. shortages to and workforce mm. shortages so one of the other things is how do you create community mm. so we're focused on we have a community engagement team we'll continue to grow that that's part of our social impact uh how do you actually then fund or have other support mechanisms i mean we look at people who live in retirement villages of which we have 109, um, the community aspect there or just actually having someone next door that in case something happens, there is someone next door that they know, yep. that plays a huge role in building those smaller communities. I mean, I remember growing up, we knew all of the neighbours that lived around us. Mm. There was a relationship with that neighbour, the Kuypets who lived next yeah. door and their three-legged cats <laughs> whizzing, right? You know, that isn't there today no. you've seen this community erode which used to look after the older lady next door and keep a keep an eye out on her you're not getting that and we need to bring that back residential living where someone's using their own home how do you create that sense of community though so um when we talk with our sort of care coordinators and the people who are working with our clients. One is around um, understanding their social needs and as part of that, engaging them in social activity. So we have um, actual dedicated social workers as part of our okay. team um, and they deal with the most complex cases and, yeah. and some of those are, you know, really isolated individuals with complex care or mental health as well to ensure that they're actually re-engaging in society our care coordinators also, we do social support. So we'll take people out for lunch, um, we'll take them shopping um, or they can come to our community group. So we do bus groups, we have art, um, we have day programs. So our day programs, um, we've got four um, sites around Adelaide and that's either day respite for carers when um, you sort of have a partner potentially or a loved one that has maybe cognitive decline. Um, or would would like more engagement with people, you can actually go and in, and engage in those activities. And it's activities, lunch, yeah. morning, afternoon, tea. They'll do a whole range of different activities like music therapy. So we actually have horticultural and music therapy. Um, or we have other community programs that we run at different sites. So there's a, there's, there's a tremendous amount being done, which is great. It, yeah. What, what's Before I jump into these quick fire questions... Mm -hmm. Last question before I do. What's the biggest myth that the aged care industry has that's quite widely viewed out there? I think the greatest myth is, oh, I just, w w when I need help, I'll get it. Mm. And then it's hard to access when you actually embark on the journey. My personal, and I say this, start your journey early. Understand what you need to do. Register with My Aged Care. Make sure you're in the system and you're on that journey because mm. a lot of the time there is the myth that, okay, when I need help it would just be there and it's not. No. And that is um, primarily because of, you know, wait times, funding I need to get assessed. Get assessed early. Get a My Aged Care number. Understand what you're either um, entitled to or not or if you do want some extra support, 
it is actually available outside of funding. Mm. So, I mean, even in our area with home care, people have the view that you can only access it with a home care package, whereas, you know, I could be paying for it for my mum, which is what we see more of today, that our generation are actually more financially secure and actually have the the disposable income to pay sometimes for that care. Mm. So would I want to pay it back to my mum or my dad that has looked after me, yeah. clothed me, fed me for I don't know how many, probably spent half a million dollars to a million dollars on me over those years. Yeah. Reinvesting back in our older adults is something we need to do more of. And, yeah. and the myth that you can access services even if you don't use Commonwealth funding. I think the second one, I'm going to get take two myths in this one, Correct. is also that people think they need to pay huge amounts of money to get into residential aged care. There are always options and there are always different ways depending on your circumstance. It's about asking because, you know, a lot of people say to me, um, and this is in particular when I was working in residential age, care is, oh, but we need half a million dollars. And I'm like, you do get it back. It's a bond. But you don't, that's not the only option you have. Actually go and talk to people. Mm. There's this myth sitting in there. And that's that's what I thought. So... There are different options. Yeah. They've got a re- what's called a residential aged care deposit, which is a RAD, which, you know, you yeah. put your bond. Or there's a DAC, which you pay a daily accommodation contribution on top of your daily care fee, which is that variance. So there are different options. Yeah, okay, great. Yeah, so Beautiful. ask the questions. If you're, if you're saying get on that aged care plan... My age care. My age care. How, what, what age? Like, is there any age? Just well, what? ideally you need to be over 65. 65, okay. So, so seniors because it, it, it yeah, yeah. different funding streams. But yeah. um, So if you're fit and healthy at 65, don't really worry about it too much? I wouldn't say don't worry about it. I'd say keep fit and healthy. So yep. strength, moving, um, keep yourself active, keep yourself engaged, whether it's going to join a new group. Um, I think there is a huge, co- I mean, we know there's a, a correlation between if you're staying physically active, your life expectancy, but also your general well-being, mm. both your emotional and physical benefits. Um, and things like, st- we, we, you know, I mean, we run a whole range of um, strength, Pilates, mat classes, exercise classes, which also keep people engaged because they're seeing and yeah, socialising, but they're also getting fit at the same time. Beautiful. Excellent. Right, quick fire questions. We're going to round this up. Um, what are you reading right now? I I laughed when I saw this because I'm like, uh, <laughs> I'm not reading anything at the moment. The last thing I read was the HBR 2023 <laughs> best <laughs> articles in the book. Um, when I when I go on holiday, I I take switch off. Switch off and I will read a whole book of something. I've got a whole list of books from. Um, lessons in chemistry, paper planes sitting next to my bed. <laughs> They've all got about 20 pages in. I tend to read, um, sounds so sad, like HBR, um, so have a business good. review. I've got I've, one on my desk. I, I think really enjoy it. Yeah, there's some good articles. And, right. and I've always enjoyed reading yeah. those types of. Um, I'm the same. Yeah, yeah. so. Beautiful. Uh, what's So on that, so then, what's one self-development book? that you believe stands out or you, or that maybe you've gifted more than anything else? Um, I think for me it was this, there's two that have always stood out for me. Um, early was Daniel Goldman's Emotional Intelligence. Mm-hmm. So I think in my first job when I moved to Sydney, we did that actually the mapping yeah. of all of the people who it's worked book, in the yeah. organisation and it was fascinating mm-hmm. around um, just, you know, the, the meta skills that make up our emotional intelligence, um, you know, As I've transitioned um, as a leader, you know, there's other aspects around mindfulness. You can't actually have emotional intelligence until you really start with the mindfulness. Mm. So that's one. Um, The other one is Malcolm Gladwell. Mm. Anything that he writes. Anything that he writes. um, I think, you know, talking to strangers. Fabulous. Fabulous. Did you listen to the audio book? I, yeah. I did. Yeah, I reckon that was... I liked the audio yeah. book. Um, yeah. I do have the actual book. But then Outliers. Oh, Outliers is... You know... Is, his, that was, yeah. That's the tipping brain. point. I mean, yeah. where, where do you go? Yeah, blink, He's blink, fascinating. Yeah, yeah, he is. I love his brain. Yeah. He's brilliant. And how he thinks. Yeah, it's fabulous. What's one lesson that's taking you the longest to learn? Patience. Yeah, I think you can like an old hands <laughs> on that one, I think. Um, if you could have coffee with one current or historical figure, who would it be? 
So it's really funny. There's, there's probably two. Okay, so Winston Churchill fascinates me. Okay. Oh. Um, because he was a master really around, um, you know, creating this different sense. You know, it was like, I'm trying to exp- thinking about how I can explain it. In, it's mastery of propaganda almost. Mm. Um, he wasn't the only one at that time who was good at that, but I think that would have been interesting. Mm. Um, and the other one was Marcus Aurelius. So you talk oh. about stoicism. Yeah, yeah. You know, Marcus Aurelius' um, meditations and you just, you know, the self, this is reflection and oh. the way, the outlook on life. And I think the, the thing I love the most about meditations is that no one was supposed to read that. Correct. Yeah. And, and you go, this was his private writings, correct. which you kind yeah. of question. Did you know? Did you think that? Yeah. Did you just leave it there for? Someone yeah, just to casually. <laughs> um, so I think that, and and the um, view of stoicism, I, I think also during COVID and out of COVID, around um, how we see the world. Mm. So yeah. that's the other one. Marcus Aurelius, I love that. Yeah, it's one of my for own. so many reasons, yeah. not just that. No, it, it just his um, the outlook of of stoicism, and you know Seneca's. Um, Books are just as good if you uh, if you want to jump onto them as well. Uh, what is some of the best advice you've ever received? Oh, I remember um, two ears, two eyes, one mouth. Yeah, um, yeah. that one been yeah. been said before. Um, but um, I think the other one for me is slow down. Mm. If you keep moving too fast, you'll actually miss it. Mm. So. Um, that one for me around just making sure I slow down. Yeah, I think I'm with you on that one. And what's one habit that holds you back the most? I think can they be the same? Yeah, probably. <laughs> they, I, think, move, I think I think I think there's. Um, th- I think the one for me is uh, the switching off, um, being able to switch off, which is hard. Yeah, really hard. What's one thing that pisses you off the most? Disabled parking spots. No, that's <laughs> um, I think I would have to say when people just – and this is probably – there's kind of – you've got your professional pet peeves and yeah. your, your personal. Um, I think for me when people sort of don't put their hand up and go, yeah, I did that, okay, this is, this is how we're going to solve it. Ownership, yeah. Ownership is a big one. Um, and I, I don't like surprises. No one, you know, some mm. people love, oh, yeah, mm. here's a box. I'm like, yeah, no, right. I'd rather know if, if something's not going well, I'd rather know it early so I, I can actually help out. Mm. Yeah. yeah. What's one word that you absolutely hate? I can't. You can't, yeah. You can't do that. No. And I'm like, really? Yeah. Watch me. Yeah. <laughs> or I just, I, we just can't do it. And I'm like, yes, you can. Yeah. You just got to think of a different way. I had an argument with a supplier of this software that we use during the week where they said, um, you have, you can't, you can't pay the, us that way. And I just went, so you're not accepting my money. Is that what you, like, I, I, I'm the exact same thing. The word can't. That, and one thing that my parents drummed into me from when I was young is there's no such word as can't. So I don't actually believe that word's true. <laughs> I mean, you know, there are some things you actually just can't do. Yeah, but I know. You, you know. I'm never going to be Tiger Woods, right? Like I'm not yeah. going to be able to hit the ball as good as he is. But, but we accept, yeah, we accept yeah, that, yeah. that that's not up yeah, in yeah, life. Correct. Right. Last, before we get to the joke, because I know you got the phone out getting ready for this joke. What's the first thing you would do if you became invisible? I did. I was thinking about this and I thought, you know, the, the typical answer would be just walk around naked. Yeah, right? yeah. I'm sure you've heard uh, that one yeah. before and I'm like, that's just too <laughs> obvious. I reckon I'd stow away on a plane and just sort of take over first class and go anywhere I want and no yeah. one would know and I could just get through customs. I could do anything I want. Beautiful. Yep. Travel the world. Travel the world and no one would know. Walk into like Sistine Chapel. Well, this is it. No Where no one's there, you know. Yeah. There's so much to explore around places you can't go today. And I'm like, ooh, that would be good. No that one would, would know good. I was there. That would be great. Right. My favourite joke. Uh, My well, favourite question, sorry. What's your best dad, mum, shit joke? So, okay, so this is the, the funny part of walking in here. I am terrible, <laughs> absolutely terrible at jokes. I don't know how many times people tell me. A joke, I cannot remember them. I can remember so much information and numbers and everything else that my team actually just sit there and it scares them how good my memory is. 
but I cannot remember a joke. <laughs> so the, the funny part is, is I have jokes in my phone constantly <laughs> on notes in case I need to pull out a joke. And this, I can't even claim this joke is oh, mine. It's funny. actually my fiance's. And um, so what type of cheese does it take to hide a horse? What type of cheese does it take to hide a horse? I don't know. Mascarpone. <laughs> <laughs> and I've got one more on the same theme. <laughs> <laughs> As I told you they were bad. Oh, I'm never going to look at the cheese, mascarpone <laughs> cheese again the same. <laughs> <laughs> what did the cheese say when she looked into the mirror? What did she say? Hello, me. <laughs> <laughs> I the, told you they yeah, were bad. The uh, hello, me is the 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 squeaky cheese, isn't it? It's like the squeaky it's, cheese. Oh, it's the, yeah, I do like hello, me, but that's brilliant. And that's the, the worst joke I've ever heard as well at the same time. Same <laughs> You can't be good at everything. <laughs> I just want to thank you so much, Claire, for your time today. Your story is inspiring. Your journey has been uh, one of grit and resilience and, and kudos to everything that you've done. Um, thank you, I guess, on behalf of the community as well for all the great work that ECH are doing in, in the space of, um, of the aged care world and really looking forward to seeing everything that you guys are going to do moving forward and, and your journey also moving forward. I'm going to be watching... Uh, from the bleachers so uh, thank you again for coming on today pleasure thank you for having me and and humbled to be part of this so thank you brilliant appreciate it thank you everyone we'll catch you next time